to uh, move forward again with the uh, next part of our program, um, which is the community perspectives and priorities. Um, and um, this is supposed to be an in-person event in which uh, it's a full day and we would go over even more uh, topics, but uh, the way that this has landed to put this, you know, I guess we can say save the best for last um, and uh, it's it important to hear from the different advocacy organizations about what they see as um, concerns from the community and about their priorities and what they're working on as organizations. So, um, I know that, uh, let's see, I do have here, oops, oh, I did from the start again. Okay, great. Um, we, uh, hopefully, I don't know if we have, um, if Jills Friedman from the American Sleep Apnea Association was able to join us. Um, I know he had a few things today. So, um, but I'll just show you quickly here are the organizations. We're gonna go in alphabetical order. Um, and so, uh, Gilles, are you there by any chance? I know he did have a conflict, so he might not be with us. Um, in which case, I think we'll just go ahead and move on to Circadian Sleep Disorders Network. Um, Alexandra Wharton. Um, Alexandra, are you with us? Yes, I am. All right, great. Um, did you wanna pull up some slides? Sure. Okay. One second here. Okay. And let's see here. Can you see that? Uh, yeah, if you could just want to put it in slide slideshow. Oh. Is that okay? Yeah, that works. Or maybe I should hear all um I think it's this, yeah, the slideshow one. Yep. No, I can't get out. That's okay. It works. Okay. Yep. So let's see here. So my name is Alexandra Wharton, and I'm a board member of the Circadian Sleep Disorders Network. And I'm here today to talk about delayed sleep phase disorder, which I'll call it's now technically called delayed sleep wake phase disorder, which I'll call DSPD. Um, and uh, it is a circadian rhythm disorder that causes a person's internal body clock to be delayed by about four hours. Um, it's an intractable condition. It can't be adjusted through self-discipline or willpower. Um, and it's actually not that rare. About one in 600 adults has it. Um, that's half a million Americans. Um, and one in 75 people have the CRY1 gene variant that's been proven to cause delayed sleep in humans. Um, unfortunately, even today, it's still you know, frequently misdiagnosed as quote unquote chronic insomnia. Um, Clinicians believe it's depression or anxiety that is causing um, the patient's inability to fall asleep earlier. Um, and, and not only is it misdiagnosed, but it's also mistreated. So first line treatments include chronotherapy, which has been shown to turn DSPD into 924, which is even worse. Um, or because it's thought to be depression or anxiety, SSRIs, uh, like Celexa are prescribed and they've been shown to maybe even weaken circadian rhythms making DSPD even worse. Um, or of course, hypnotics like Ambien, which can lead to dependency. So needless to say, more awareness, awareness of DSPD and all circadian rhythm disorders uh, is desperately needed. Um, the growth of Fitbit and personal activity trackers has generated mainstream interest in monitoring a person's sleep patterns. However, technology isn't really required. Um, you can just print out a two week sleep log from the internet and fill it out with a pencil, <laughs> take it to your doctor. Um, that I feel really passionate about this in terms of diagnosis. Um, and that clinician should take a careful patient history. And when a patient says, I can't fall asleep until four o'clock in the morning, every night, despite following all the basic 
you know, best practices for sleep hygiene, like, you know, getting up at the same time every day and not drinking alcohol and not drinking caffeine and exercising and light and da 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 they should have, uh, you know, DSPD in mind. Um, unfortunately, that's still not, you know, quite happening. You can go to a sleep specialist who trained at the Mayo Clinic in Austin, Texas, and they will still give you the, uh, you know, you lack willpower speech. It's very frustrating. So a sleep log and a careful patient history um, are all you really need to, to diagnose DSPD. They're more effective than an overnight sleep study. Of course, you know, sleep studies are still important for ruling out other things. Um, also, um, biomarkers like cortisol and melatonin, um, of course, those, that kind of testing is very cumbersome, but you can actually track it in somebody and it will indicate that a person does indeed have a later chronotype. Several neurological and metabolic conditions are comorbid with DSPD um, from diabetes to bipolar disorder to autism. In fact, something like 80% of ADHD cases in children report having delayed sleep. Um, and it makes perfect sense to me. It's, it's energy at the wrong time of the day. And MRI can actually show that a night owl, a person with DSPD, that's kind of like the warm fuzzy word. For it. Some people don't like that word, but I think when we talk about an extreme night owl, night owl meaning somebody who can't fall asleep till four o'clock in the morning or later, it actually shows that um, their prefrontal cortex is in a disabled offline state until the late morning. Um, for typical sleepers, environmental cues you know, help set their body clock. And that's, of course, something that we've all been told since we were children. Um, you know, light exposure, social activities, meal times, body temperature. Um, those are the things that set your body clock uh, for a typical sleeper. However, these cues are not effective for people with DSPD. There is simply something else going on. Um, possible causes include reduced or oversensitivity to light, deficiencies in a certain type of retinal ganglion cell called the IPRGCs, um, reduced melatonin production, a longer intrinsic circadian phase, homeostatic processing disorders where, you know, we don't have like the buildup of sleep throughout the day that a typical person does. Um, for treatments, there really is no magic bullet for DSPD. Um, light therapy and melatonin have been recommended for decades. Now on the market, there's some melatonin agonists like Hetlioz. Um, most importantly, uh, for, for most I would say, who have this is an accommodated schedule. Um, simply being able to you know, ask for and get later hours. Um, so if you work in a nine to five office, can I come in 11 to seven? Um, and of course, the COVID pandemic has kind of demonstrated that the world doesn't fall apart when we have accommodated schedules, right? Um, to develop more effective treatments, obviously, we need to understand the physiological underpinnings of what's happening. Um, and there is some hope on the horizon in that. In that. Um, of course, I think everybody knows that the Nobel Prize winners in 2017 um, were body clock researchers, and they, um, and, um, among many things that they did, they investigated how mammals' biorhythms sync with the rotation of the earth. And of course, some have a 22-hour long clock, some have a 27-hour long clock. Um, also on the horizon is a blood test called time signature. That's what it's called right now anyway. Um, it's not clinically available yet. It was developed by Dr. Phyllis Z in Chicago and, and several other people there that calculates a person's circadian phase by measuring different gene expression markers. Of course, this could be a big game changer. Um, we do know that various circadian clock genes um, are implicated or, or cause delayed sleep. I already talked about CRY1, which uh, stands for cryptochrome. Um, but there's other ones like the clock gene, the per gene. And I know I saw Dr. Patachik's uh, talk earlier, so he, he already touched on this, but um, he and Dr. Fu's lab at UCSF 
have, has identified uh, a gene variant for short sleepers. And I was actually in one of his studies 15, 16 years ago, which um, got me, piqued my interest in all of this. <laughs> um, of course, now with 23andMe, um, you can do that at home. Um, and they have some of the variants for morningness. And, you know, as I've been told, the eveningness ones, it's a lot more complicated. It's a little bit messier, but hopefully they will get there. Um, UC Santa Cruz's lab, Dr. Carrie Parch, she is also investigating the CRY1 variant that I mentioned um, and how it alters the biological clock. And she, she said in a release last year or two years ago that, you know, they hope to develop therapeutics that could actually shorten um, the, the body clock. Um, and then finally, this is really interesting. This was just, just announced like last month, um, two different universities. They um, identified the cryptochrome 4 protein in the retina of a European robin, which is a songbird that migrates at night. Um, and they found that this protein is sensitive to magnetic fields and could be the long sought magnetic sensor, which would mean that environmental stimuli, just like I was talking about with those environmental cues, um, is a lot less important than has been previously thought. So a lot of exciting things I think happening um, in, with chronobiologists, um, but in the meantime, um, I'm working as part, as part of Circadian Sleep Disorders Network, and I'm also a chapter leader for Start School Later Texas, and, and in addition to some other sleep organizations. And you know, I'm, I'm just trying to push that we need to reassess our nine to five schedule. Um, our work no longer requires sunlight, and only 1% of the U.S. population works in agriculture, yet we still live on a, you know, an agrarian schedule. <laughs> um, and in conclusion, um, we just need to increase awareness um, that DSPD is a physiological condition and not a psychological condition, um, improve diagnosis. And again, like that doesn't need to be, it can be a printed out sleep log is a great start. Um, improve treatments, increase the amount of treatments, seek accommodations at work and school and reduce the stigma of having a late chronotype. Like, you know, it's okay to go to bed later and wake up later and not calling it sleeping in. That's it. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, such great information. One in 6,000, wow. One in 600. 600, that's what I meant. Oh my gosh, that's what, that's what I was saying in my head, but um, <laughs> one in 600, yes. I, I think that this is like a, could be, you know, a very important um, change. And I love to hear about the time signature that you mentioned and hope that that will continue to advance. So um, thank you again for presenting on behalf of the uh, Circadian Sleep Disorders Network. Uh, next we have the Hypersomnia Foundation. I believe I saw Rebecca King here. I'm here. Hi, Rebecca. Hello, how are you? Good, good. Um, did you so, have some? I have slides, but I can't start them until um, the other ones come down. Okay. Alexander, do you see how to? Um, oh, perfect, thank you. Okay, so um, I just have three slides. And since this is a legislative advocacy themed conference, I was thinking, you know, what would be the three most important legislative advocacy topics for the hypersomnia community? So in our case, we're primarily supporting people with idiopathic hypersomnia, but we include related sleep disorders within the umbrella just because there's so much overlap. There's a whole lot of narcolepsy type two people that hang out with us too. Some of us have multiple diagnoses, and so we just, you know, have open arms for everybody. But um, I think the three themes are not going to be a surprise to anyone. Uh, the first one, though, is a little specific to idiopathic hypersomnia, which is we don't know anything about what causes it. In fact, people with this diagnosis love to say they hate the word idiopathic um, because it means we don't know what is causing it. So we don't have any etiologies. We don't have any biomarkers. We don't have any phenotypes. And it's just really hard to start down the path of trying to figure out 
how to effectively treat a disorder if you literally have no knowledge about it. So this is one of the reasons why we've been happy to join in the legislative advocacy efforts that continue to fund the NIH and the CDC and the FDA because these are all organizations that we are going to need in order to get to the point where we have some knowledge about what causes the disease. So it's, it's not like people haven't been trying, but lately I heard a quote about it's been 40 years we've been trying and we still haven't found a biomarker yet. So at this point, um, you know, I think that it's been great to see the budget of the NIH in particular being supported in the last few years. I know they're there. Uh, we just need to get to the point where we have some startup research so that people can actually apply for NIH grants. So our challenge at the current time is how do we um, promote young researchers? How do we help people do those startup research uh, programs that are needed to generate enough information in order to successfully apply and win an NIH grant. So we did actually just this year announce a first ever partnership with ASM Foundation. So our, our foundation is uh, working with them to sponsor some Hypersomnia Foundation research. So hopefully in the middle of next year, we'll have some exciting announcements of upcoming research that we're jointly sponsoring. The second topic that's really become of critical importance within our foundation is health equity, specific within the hypersomnias. And this came about largely because, um, first of all, we heard from our pharmaceutical partners that all of the people volunteering for clinical trials are non-Hispanic white females. Why is that? <laughs> Well, one of the things that we did uh, do then is to look at our patient database, which has been used to recruit for these clinical trials to see who is in there. So we do use the same questions that are used on the US census in order to, so it's a two part question, um, in order to develop what the racial and ethnic backgrounds are. And when you look at the census for the United States about who is actually out there versus who is actually in our database, it's glaringly obvious that non-Hispanic whites um, are the 92%, essentially, actually almost 93% of the participants in our database. So of course you can't get diversity in clinical trial participation if your starting point is a registry that is overwhelmingly non-Hispanic whites. So then you start asking the questions, where are all the people of diverse backgrounds? Why are they not in the registry? And it's, it's gonna be a really tough nut to crack. Uh, you know, are people of diverse backgrounds not even getting to diagnosis? Or if they're getting to diagnosis, are they even finding the Hypersomnia Foundation? And if they are, when presented with the opportunity to join a database, are they choosing not to participate in the database and in the, you know, and by extension, not to participate in clinical trials? So it's likely that we actually have impacts at all stages of the develop, you know, getting your diagnosis, finding the foundation, and joining in on clinical trial uh, efforts. So it's going to be incredibly complex. But as we um, have formed a health uh, a diversity and health equity task force and started learning as much as we can about inequities in healthcare in particular, it's just so clear there are so many structural barriers and there is huge legislative advocacy Im implications for how do you uh, be get better equality in healthcare. So I'm just going to leave it at that. We don't know how to handle it. We're trying to figure out what a foundation can do to help participate in, in fixing the problem, um, but clearly it's beyond the reach of just one foundation and it's a nationwide, if not global issue. Lastly, I just wanna spend five minutes on um, access and affordability for healthcare and, and in particular prescription medications. So, you know, we like to view it as a series of hurdles that you have to jump over in order to end up taking your medication we know from a survey of our community that at any given point, about 40% of people are not able to take the medication that their doctor has prescribed for them due to an insurance access or affordability issue. 
And that 40% not being able to take their medication number is really only of people who already have insurance. So they've already been able to jump over the first hurdle. Well, what about all the people that are out there that don't have any insurance? Um, so we believe that the overall percentage of people out there not able to access their medication is higher than 40%. We just have no way of quantifying how high it really, really is. So a lot of the discussions earlier today on step therapy and the discussions going on on Capitol Hill about prescription drug pricing, there's just so many legislative advocacy topics underneath this umbrella. Um, but the end result is there's a whole lot of people who are suffering because they cannot get their medications. And that's what I brought, Julie. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for touching on these important areas um, and for all of your work uh, at, and the work of the Hypersomnia Foundation. Uh, it's an incredible resource. <laughs> Their website is one of the websites I'm always sending people to on so many diff different topics um, from um, the disability, you know, uh, applying for disability to um, how to get a service dog. Uh, it's just an incredible website <laughs> uh, with so much information, never mind the incredible individuals behind it and all the other work they're doing. So exciting to hear about some of the research uh, work um, that could help set people up for some of those bigger NIH grants. That's, that's really exciting. Well, just real quick on that topic, during this past year, uh, we did spend a huge amount of time and effort building uh, websites having to do with disability insurance and, a and drug appeals and denials. So if anybody is interested in it, feel free to link to it. I think the um, how to appeal an insurance company denial is one of the most comprehensive sites you could find out there. And, and again, we encourage people to link to it if, they, if that's a resource that could be helpful. Thank you. Good to know. We will do that. <laughs> so helpful. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, we have the KLS Foundation next. I believe we have Richard Mayer joining us. Uh, Richard, are you with us? Let's see. I'm going to change my view to the gallery. Um, I'm not hearing Richard, so why don't we move on um, to the Narcolepsy Network? Amy, uh, Amy Kant, I believe you're presenting in yes. uh, yeah. Okay, great. Hi, Julie. Hi, so, Amy. Hi, it's good to see everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. So, um, well, first of all, thank you, Project Sleep, for this wonderful um, forum. We're delighted to be here. Um, I am the Transition Director at Narcolepsy Network, um, and I'm going to provide you a, a bit of an overview of Narcolepsy Network. Many of you are familiar, and some of you may not be, as well as an update about where we are and some of our current priorities. So for those of you who don't know about us, we are probably the oldest uh, patient organization in the space for narcolepsy. Uh, we were founded in 1986. We support people with narcolepsy and we have been hosting an annual conference, a very large one for many years, which is often the first time that people with narcolepsy meet one another. So it's played a very vital role in creating a sense of community um, for, for narcolepsy. It's it's actually over 35 years um, that Narcolepsy Network has been around, and its role has been to educate, um, very similar to many of the other advocacy organizations out there, and also to bring patient perspectives um, to help support the clinical investigational work over the last 10 to 15, 20, actually 20 years. We've participated in FDA meetings, um, we have been a key um, player in terms of our industry partnerships and helping people be aware of some of the investigational research work that is out there. Uh, we also have been partners and we're thrilled to partner with Project Sleep on um, the at legislative advocacy initiatives. We also do some work with RDLA and Every Life Foundation and NORD. Uh, we we are, are probably the most focused legislative advocacy work we've had is with our um, youth ambassador program, which uh, in which we train young people to go to Congress and to begin to have their voice uh, be heard. 
In terms of narcolepsy network and where we are today, I mean, we've been around for 35 years. We have tremendous reach online. We have over 14,000 Facebook members. Uh, We have a 6,000 person email list. Narcolepsy affects one in in every 2,000. So, you know, it's it's important that we grow that reach too. Um, As I mentioned, we, we currently, as some of you know, are in a transition and I try to reflect on why organizations go in transition because my background is in rare disease, working with organizations when they transition. And what I find is as a community grows and as there is more awareness of that and as more engagement happens through industry, through the medical community, through the governmental organizations, organizations also need to grow. And and that's part of where Narcolepsy Network is today and part of where it is in terms of looking at itself and how it can better serve the community and be a partner with the other organizations out there that that we're hearing about today. Um, One of the things that we did recently was we had a presentation at our annual conference, Narcolepsy, a Sleep Disorder at Last in the Spotlight. Dr. Lois Cron walked through the amazing evolution of treatments in the space. And, and what it's meant for this community. We've had, you know, we have had some treatments for 20 years that have been fantastic for the community. And now we have some new entries into the market. This is wonderful for this community. And what Dr. Cron talked about, well, what does that mean for patient organizations? What do we do as potential advocates and how do we support and learn how to support more effectively? Um, and that brings us to sort of who we are as an organization. We're a membership organization, meaning we're governed by members. They, we serve the people who are participants who vote for our board of directors, which means we have a responsibility to not only reflect the voice of our members, but also to direct our future programming towards what they want. And so that's a part of what the current leadership and narcolepsy network is looking at today. Um, So that brings us to the next piece, which is we need to continue our core programs and we will, but part of what we see as an organization in transition is the importance of listening to community members and examining where does advocacy grow from here. So it's really relevant to many of the topics that have been spoken about today. And part of this process of examining what is advocacy, because it's legislative, it's in terms of healthcare access, it's working with the patient, it's working with clinicians, it's working with primary care providers, it's working with governmental organizations. It's a large, large plate there. So we can't do everything <laughs> and we can't do everything really well, but what we can do is listen to our community and hear what they believe is important. So we began, we began that process in the spring. We held two focus groups healthcare access focus groups to say, okay, what are you seeing in the community? What matters to you out there? And you'll be surprised, not so much, to hear many of the issues that were talked about today. So in terms of the issues that um, relate to education, it's around where do we find information? How do we find a clear path to that information? Um, a central way of navigating this complex web of information of healthcare resources. How do we find the specialists that make sense for us, sleep centers, particularly in areas that are not urban areas? Um, What types of pamphlets do we need to educate both the healthcare community, the um, work, the, the employer community, the school community? How do we educate this large audience about what is narcolepsy and why does it matter, you know, to know about it because it affects quite a few people. Um, One in 2000 is still a pretty high number, Uh, not as high as one in 600, but still fairly high and it's largely undiagnosed. And then the other piece is what does it mean to educate clinicians, primary care doctors and providers in narcolepsy? The respond, the people in the focus group said, you know, this is all the doctors that I went to. And it wasn't until I went to this one doctor that they said, aha. And this relates very much to the screening programs that we were seeing. It relates to all of those issues. Um, The next piece of this was support. 
This is, I think Julie calls it one of the pillars. In the end of the day, this is a, a um, disease that doesn't go away. There's not a magic bullet for it. And you have to navigate your life. So there's more than just support groups, which Narcolepsy Network has quite a few. There's a large national group of affiliates. Um, but part of what we need to look at is what are the needs within support groups and are there best practices within support groups? And how does it make an impact in, in um, a person with narcolepsy's life? The other piece is mental health counseling. How do they access it and get it paid for? We heard a lot about getting paid for, and that was certainly the same issue that people were reporting in these focus groups. Um, mentorship programs, which is a little different than and support and support, which is really how do I talk about this to my employer? How do I talk about this at school? How do I talk about it to my family members? And this relates to really a self-advocacy mission, which um, we have some programs around that as well. So the next piece is really the piece around patient advocacy that many of the issues that were talked about today that came up in these focus groups, the insurance approvals, the pre-approval authorizations, um, the step therapy, the is, does my insurance, is it the right insurance to cover? How do I find the right insurance to cover? And then medication affordability. If I don't cover it, how do I get it covered? Or if if they're not going to do, if I have step therapy and I can't get the medication I want, how do I get it? And hearing people talk about it from their real world experience, obviously we've talked about how powerful that is. It's probably very powerful on the, in the advocacy land where you're talking to folks, um, whether you're talking to legislators or you're talking to insurance companies or whoever you're trying to impact. Um, and then addressing medical bias. We were hearing um, from a variety of folks in the, focus groups that this doctor thinks this, this doctor thinks that, there's different points of view, how do I navigate that? Uh, another issue, and this wasn't talked about in as much detail, but it was about, there isn't, well, first there isn't maybe a central narcolepsy network, nar not narcolepsy, network, narcolepsy patient registry, but what about reported outcomes? How do we learn about the medication impacts um, and different, you know, where do we fit in with these symptoms and how do we share that information? That's something that also comes up a lot in our Facebook, um, in our face, closed Facebook group. It also comes a lot in, up a lot in, in um, support groups too, like where do we get this information? So a patient registry, which is a huge, which are huge undertakings, but ones that are relevant for people with their clinicians who are prescribing medication. And then the diagnosis time frame, which we heard about too, the frustration around that. And we heard some great opportunities to um, have a questionnaire where people that that would be very helpful to the community. Focus groups talked about that. Sleep studies, access to sleep studies and getting those covered. So that's just a small piece of it, but it really echoes what everyone was saying in the professional community, but it was coming through the voice of the person with narcolepsy or family members. And being able to, as an organization, Narcolepsy Network, being able to understand where do we fit in and how do we support this is really the future work that you know, we want to explore with our partners and with, with all the folks that we work with. And then a huge shout out to Project Sleep to thank you for bringing everybody together because that's part of convening is part of what, you know, what makes biggest impact. So thank you, Julie. Thank you, Amy. Um, this is a really exciting presentation. I, I love um, hearing, you know, your work with the focus groups and, and looking for the future for Narcolepsy Network. It's so important. There's so much to be done. <laughs> As a person with narcolepsy, of course, I'm a little biased to the importance of <laughs> all the work to be done in the narcolepsy community. So I'm really grateful for you for um, looking for ways to um, move forward and, and to collaborate and, and glad to have you here as part of this and talking about advocacy. Um, Thank so you. Um, we have the National Sleep Foundation. Uh, John Lopez, are you here? I'm and here. Can you hear Hi. me? And see me? Yes. Hello. Sorry, I, was, I was on the dark screen there for a second. Let me just show you my 
my slides. And into presentation mode. Well, while I'm doing this, I wanted to thank you, uh, Julie, for inviting us to participate this year. We apologize that we weren't available for the inaugural program last year, but it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And just a couple of quick comments, and I will try to stick to time. Although a lot of you who know me already know that I could talk all day. Um, but it's it's very encouraging to see the range of people who've gathered today that you brought together and already the, the many points of intersection and the, the complementary opportunities that we have for each other. And also appreciating some of the differences that we have across the different organizations that in a collective, we can combine to make things happen. So thank you for inviting us. There's only one National Sleep Foundation. We've been around for over 30 years, uh, dnsf.org is where you can find more information about the NSF online. Um, simply put, the NSF's audience is the public, the public at large. That would also, of course, include people who are living with uh, disordered sleep. Um, mission for the organization, and it has been the focus for, for decades, is improving health and well-being through sleep education and advocacy. Goals for the organization range from having sleep health accepted as a crucial measure of overall health. Incidentally, we used to use language specific to vital sign. We can talk a little bit more about that at another time. I think that uh, Andrew Phillips shared some uh, particularly insight, uh, insight around that. So thank you, Andrew. Um, also that the healthy sleep is um, based on a sleep wake process that our community infrastructure, community with a capital C, our community infrastructure and environments respect sleep health and that ultimately science, sleep science and insight are rapidly incorporated into what we consider as important accessible health products and services. So what does the NSF work to advance? We'll talk about three domains very quickly. We think that the public really needs to benefit from advances in theory and research, from awareness and education, and not just awareness, but really internalizing their knowledge of, of what's gonna help them sleep better, and then practice uh, best practices, and then empowering them to change behaviors. I'll speak just briefly about each of those domains, what we think is important that we do for the public. Starting with theory, we have a peer-reviewed journal. And one of all, I'll say this again, one of, one of our jobs, frankly, is to translate. Translate the science, translate thought leadership, whether it's ours or other colleagues' thought leadership, as we come together, into something that people can, can do to, to improve their sleep, to, to have healthy sleep. Um, we start with the journal. It's an important platform for scientific research. It's an important platform for us on issues like sleep health disparities. Um, we look at guidelines uh, that we develop. We started with the sleep duration guideline in 2015 that's been cited uh, repeatedly. We have half a dozen different guidelines that we've put out since then. And then research that we do with our products, including the Sleep Health Index and the Sleep in America poll, where we've had tens of thousands of respondents over time we're able to provide a pulse check on how America is sleeping. And incidentally, outside of the United States, the Sleep Health Index has been used by um, approaching 200,000 users. So those are some of the research tools that we use and some of the platforms that we use for the public, starting uh, in the theoretical and moving in, into common practice. Awareness and education. We have two evergreen campaigns every year. They're pegged to the clock change. Uh, we don't think clock change is a good thing, by the way. Uh, sleep Awareness Week in the spring and Drowsy Driving Prevention Week uh, in the fall. Drowsy Driving Prevention Week is coming up. It's November 7th to 14th. Uh, our Drowsy Driving Prevention Week is a time for everyone to rally around public health and safety on the roads. Sleep Awareness Week in the spring. Our Sleep Awareness Week has been going on for almost 30 years now. Again, another opportunity for all of us to rally around sleep health. Um, awareness and education through a variety of platforms that NSF uses to get out content. Our website, the NSF.org, but also all of the other opportunities where the public consumes content. So our partner sites, social medias, uh, media opportunities. Um, and then also uh, another educational opportunity uh, that is new to us. We're going to be publishing a uh, sleep health textbook for public health. This is uh, one of the few, if, if not the first, of a public health textbook uh, for sleep health that will be published next month. And then we're also 
in the professional space. We're an accredited provider for CME. Uh, we also develop educational uh, programming for healthcare providers and for their patients that's not accredited. And so we have a broad range of, of offerings in education. And then I mentioned it before, we're about translation, right? So how do we get the guidelines that we develop and, other, and the science translated into usable tools and information for the public? Uh, we develop these types of, uh, a little bit of eye candy here, but we develop these types of tools and, and references for the public. Again, ranging from how much sleep do I need to what are the tips, or what do I need to remember on a daily basis to get good, healthy sleep? Um, and then finally, uh, with respect to having content available where people are consuming it, we have a focus on technology. We want to drive sleep health technology. We want to recognize innovation. We've been involved in setting standards, uh, most recently for wearable devices with ANSI and the CTA. And you can look at some of our recent partnerships, including with Samsung Health, where we're providing sleep health information on what someone's wearing on the wrist. So with the NSF, we... What the public sees ranges from heritage to authority to insight, to innovation, and effectiveness. And let's talk really briefly, if I still have some time, about the policy initiatives and priorities that are important uh, for National Sleep Foundation. Uh, because it's coming right up, drowsy driving prevention. Our drowsy driving prevention week again is November 7th to 14th. That's a, a chance for all of us to rally around public health and safety on the roads. It's a function of getting uh, good sleep. Uh, sleep health disparities, I think we would echo. Uh, the need uh, for work for all of us to do in, in, in that space uh, that we've talked about several times already today. Adolescent sleep health and school start times, we've supported work already um, earlier in the year at Stanford University and uh, with a, a group of, of very invested leaders as it relates to school start times. Our position on permanent standard time has been made known. We support permanent standard time. We don't think clock change is good. Um, on the Hill, we continue, and to the extent that we can stay engaged with the Hill during a time of pandemic, uh, we stay engaged around military, active military and veterans, the importance of sleep health in this community, whether they're in theater or back home, uh, older populations in long-term care, and of course, workplace safety. We'll be engaging on the Hill, and we look for opportunities where we all can engage together uh, in these areas, um, on the Hill and also with the relevant government agencies. So as I conclude, I don't know where I am with five minutes, but uh, in service to the public, NSF is a resource. NSF is a collaborator. We advocate for sleep health policy change on the basis of research, evidence, and public health goals. Uh, we're an established, unique voice for sleep health. We look for opportunities for all of us to work together. And thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much, John. Thank you to the NSF uh, for incredible amount of work, education. Really excited about the textbook. Um, you know, that's that's the nerd in me. Can't wait to have it on the shelf. I have two shelves for sleep right here. So um, we'll be excited to see that. That's such an important um, addition to an already incredible array of education um, and awareness that you guys are doing. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being here. And we're so glad to have you as part of this discussion uh, as such an important part of this community. So Project Sleep is next. Um, I'll just quickly share a little bit about Project Sleep. We're a patient-led uh, 501c3 nonprofit uh, founded in 2013. Uh, our mission is around advocacy and awareness for sleep health and sleep disorders. Our vision is to make sleep cool. Uh, so uh, really important in that translation that uh, John talked about. And there's so much work to be done. <laughs> Um, that, you know, uh, think there's so many different ways to approach awareness and advocacy. Uh, and for us, I think, um, thinking about storytelling as, as one of the major vehicles, uh, you got to hear from Farah today, one of over 100 storytellers that we have trained um, across the country and around the world, uh, including people with narcolepsy, people with idiopathic hypersomnia, and I believe we still have Emma uh, on the broadcast, was our first graduate uh, of the program with sleep apnea. So yes, we are thinking to slightly rebrand the rising voices uh, of narcolepsy to maybe something a little bit, um, you know, that it will be more encompassing to people with different sleep disorders because we do believe this is a model that can be successful for, um, uh, for people with a number of conditions. And many of the advocates are on the, um, on the Zoom today. So shout out to all of our rising voices trainees and graduates. 
Um, for advocacy, we have five main principles that uh, govern how we conduct ourselves in our work. Uh, we partner with the Sleep Research Society on advancing research, uh, but also as a patient-led and, and driven organization, it's important for us to be thinking about accelerating treatment options, ensuring access to healthcare, uh, furthering education, awareness, and training through, you know, why we have the CDC with us today and talking about screening and, um, and diagnosis and bringing those delayed di diagnosis times down. And addressing sleep health disparities is another um, guiding principle uh, that we work on throughout the year. And really excited to share that we just received a grant uh, in collaboration with Dr. Granier, uh, along with Dr. Uh, Robert Turner, uh, that is a part of the uh, Harmony Biosciences uh, recent um, uh, set of awards. And we're gonna look, uh, do some focus groups to better understand um, barriers uh, to sleep disorders diagnosis in Black Americans. Uh, so very excited to uh, do that project this year and thankful to Harmony for putting out that grant opportunity as well. Uh, and thanks again to everyone's advocacy. As you know, one of our major efforts in partnership with the Sleep Research Society and these other organizations that are here today is to do the big uh, letter in the spring. So uh, usually around March, or so, we are asking uh, advocates, grassroots advocates, to reach out to their representatives to get them signed on to a, a bipartisan letter supporting different sleep community priorities. And um, I think it's just we got 54 members of Congress signed on last year, and I and I this is huge. Um, the power of the grassroots movement, um, of the passion uh, that patients feel, and now that we have an opportunity for them to be channeling that into um, results uh, of getting these members of Congress signed on and then advancing those pieces um, that are in the letter uh, through the system is really exciting. So um, that's what I had to share. Um, and I believe next uh, we have the RLS Foundation. Uh, Linda, I believe, Linda, yeah, you're there. Hi, Linda. Hi. So I'll go ahead and unshare here. Did you have some slides to share? No, I don't think I'm to be trusted with technology. So <laughs> it just sent me. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you for including the Restless Leg Syndrome Foundation today. It's been an exciting day. Um, I'm in, uh, Linda Secretan. I'm a board member and also someone who lives with Restless Leg Syndrome every day and night. Uh, I'm here, uh, Carla Dzenkowski, our executive director, handed the baton to me today because she, and she's missing a big day. <laughs> I've noticed there's so many tendrils from every presenter um, that, that creep into the restless legs syndrome, you know, and, and our advocacy too. And one thing Carla told me was that, well, don't worry, you can come and go during the day. As if I could tear myself away. I could not. <laughs> so today, um, I want to present our four areas of current big concern. Um, one is proper diagnosis. One is appropriate treatment, access to proper treatment, and then continued and increased research. So I'll speak briefly to each of those four areas of concern. So proper diagnosis, and this is an echo of what we've heard, isn't it? It's crucial. Um, it's a chronological, neurological, a chronic neurological sleep disorder. It affects 10% of the population. That's a lot. So unlike other sleep disorders, I don't know how unlike, but unlike some of the other sleep disorders, RLS is mostly diagnosed by a patient's described symptoms. Um, and they can vary significantly from patient to patient. Um, research has shown that low brain iron levels dopaminergic dysfunction and genetics are the three leading factors to cause RLS. But a British study has found that it takes an average of 13 years for patients to find a doctor who knows how to recognize RLS and then of course who knows how to treat it. So that's a, a long, long time. Um, it made me think of narcolepsy in Dr. Hassan's quest for diagnosis and how long that took and how happy I was that she found a diagnosis at the end of it. With RLS, quite often um, doctors aren't aware of it still and don't know how to diagnosis, diagnose it. And this is sort of off my brief right now, but thinking about children too, how many, for children, how many of them 
uh, sleep deprivation or lack of sleep manifests as, as hyperactivity. And so they're so often misdiagnosed with ADHD and treated improperly, often with drugs that worsen their sleep dis disability. So yeah, that's a really, that's a, a heart tugging one for me too. Um, uh, the foundation right now um, it tries to assist the 12 million men, women, and children that have RLS with um, trying to enhance the education that healthcare professionals receive. And so the textbook, wow, this is a great, this is great news. Um, so if we can improve the education professionals, that's really the best way to get a proper diagnosis of RLS because it can be diagnosed. There are criteria that a simple patient survey and it makes it pretty much impossible to ignore. So the second area, appropriate treatment, uh, represents our second concern. Until very recently, physicians pre prescribed dopaminergic agents such as Mirapex or Requip um, as the first line treatment. And many of them I believe are still um, prescribing that as a first line treatment for RLS. Um, well, they escalated dosages because it's, it, at one point it stops working. It doesn't work as well, well beyond the FDA approved amounts to control the sy symptoms. Whereas recent research has proven that dopamine agonists not only lose effectiveness over time, but make RLS symptoms worse. So it's a pro process they've identified and called augmentation, which is <laughs> patients who have been diagnosed, given, prescribed the first line uh, drug for RLS find that it's not working, so they take more, and the doctor prescribes more, and then pretty soon they're getting their symptoms earlier in the day, and it's not only in their eggs, legs, but maybe in their arms. Um, so it was a big day when we learned to identify that and name it, but then to, to the um, getting off of that is terrible. So physicians don't recognize this as a side effect that requires that you discontinue the drug. So a major goal of physicians who do understand augmentation is to get their patients off dopamine agonists and it requires a long period of tapering off. So when they can achieve that, we found that now the first line treatment is iron therapy um, or alpha-2 delta ligands such as gabapentin uh, formulations which do not cause augmentation. When a patient's symptoms cannot be managed of any of these approaches, and that's me, <laughs> any of these approaches, <laughs> uh, treatment of the last resort is the appropriate loose use of low total daily dose opioids, carefully monitored, carefully managed by a knowledgeable physician. This, this leads to our third major area of concern, access to proper treatment. Uh, you already know what I'm going to say. It's hard to get treatment with opioids for this condition. In the current crisis, which we know is quite real and, and would never deny that, RLS patients who have been on the same low total daily dose opio op op opioid for years, sometimes for decades, have faced barriers to having their prescriptions filled. Um, you face personal and professional disapproval. You've been, we've been sent away by doctors who fear professional damage if they prescribe any opioid for any reason at all, in spite of clear guidelines for their use. And there are clear guidelines. Patients have had to relocate, to move, to travel long distances, even to find a doctor willing to prescribe the same low uh, total daily do dose opioid that they've been taking for many decades sometimes, or have been sent to pain clinics for treatment by doctors who aren't knowledgeable about sleep disorders like RLS. And so the treatment is, is quite different and the symptoms are quite different. The low total daily dose of an opioid to manage RLS is significantly lower than that used to manage chronic pain. It does not lead to clinical indi indications of addiction or tolerance or any behavioral manifestations. Here again, more education about RLS and its proper diagnosis and treatment, starting in medical school, school with good textbooks <laughs> uh, is the best hope to remedy the situation. It, it really starts there. For the worst sufferers from RLS, unrelieved symptoms have not only deprived them of sleep and livelihood many times, but have led to feelings of despair and sometimes suicide many RLS patients will describe suicidal ideation. 
It's, it's a serious disease. The fourth and final concern, a major concern right now is continued and increased research. All of us would applaud, would applaud any research that's coming our way. And one thing I wanted to say is hearing uh, from all the uh, sleep disorders that we've heard from today, what I've discovered in trading stories in the sleep community is when we do that, each of us says about the other, oh, how do you live with that? And have so much compassion for other sleep disorders. It's a big community, but I think it speaks to the fact that we somehow get by. We learn to, to go ahead somehow if we possibly can and have so much empathy for everyone else in the sleep community that they're able to do the same and wonder, wonder at their courage at being able to do it. So the increased research as our concern um, it's, it's, there is a lot of published research on RLS. It's easy to find. And lately we've seen there's a, the Mayo Clinic algorithm for diagnosing RLS is a big news for us. Our foundation can only provide a small seed grants to researchers indicate, interested in RLS, but we're gratified to know that many of our grantees have gone on to win major awards from federal agencies. The key is for those federal agencies to define and fund research into neuroscience broadly defined that will attract new researchers, young researchers to the sleep study of sleep disorders, including RLS. Thank you so much. Thanks again for having us here. Thank you so much, Linda. It's so nice to meet you, e meet yes. you. Um, yeah. And just so grateful to the RLS Foundation, uh, always professionally as a great collaborator and friend in the community, but most recently personally uh, with a friend of mine um, experiencing RLS and um, Carla just jumped right in and tried to, you know, and, and was supplying me with all the information and all the help. Uh, so it's just uh, really so grateful for all the resources and work you guys do. Um, so um, we have start school later, second, we, maybe next year we're going to do reverse alphabetical, so mi mix this up, um, but hopefully we have Kara or Phyllis here with us from start school later. Yeah, we have Kara, I'm here, hi. Hi. Hi, and Julie, thank you so much for having us. Thank you to everybody who's stuck it out and stayed late. I agree with you, we should change the change up the alphabetical order is, and I say that as a person who spent most of my life as Tara Zaporin with a Z. Um, but I, I will say I, I am Tara, Dr. Tara Zaporin Snyder. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Start School Later slash Healthy Hours. And maybe we'll just go by Healthy Hours next time. Then we'll, then we'll move up in the lineup. In any case, thank you to everyone. It's really, it's actually been inspiring hearing about what everybody else is doing. And it's also been quite gratifying to hear how many people are aware of the issue of too early school start times. Because what we do at Start School Later, and we are a nonprofit coalition um, dedicated to increasing public awareness about the relationship of sleep and school hours and to ensuring school start times that are compatible with healthy sleep and with general health and safety education and equity. But as that kind of organization, we're kind of different than most of the other groups here because we aren't, you know, we're not, we don't work with a sleep disorder. We, we actually work with a social disorder, I would say. Um, but we definitely have benefited from working with the sleep advocacy community and obviously our goals work um, together. So thank you for having me. I did want to tell those of you who may not know, although I doubt at this point there's anyone here in that category, but why our coalition started and why we care about this issue so much. And it really comes down to the fact that there is a large, broad, and consistent body of evidence that has been building up for decades um, that, that shows that requiring teenagers to be in class before about 8.30 in the morning interferes not only with their school performance, but also impairs memory, attention, judgment, and it increases truancy, absenteeism, tardiness, dropout rates, but there's more. That same evidence also shows that sending children to school at, at five or 6 a.m. and or putting young drivers on the roads when they are sleep deprived is dangerous and not just to the students, but to the entire community. The evidence also shows that dismissing teenagers, especially sleep, sleep deprived teenagers from school early in the afternoon, which often happens when school starts so early, 
um, and leaving them unsupervised for three or four hours predisposes them to many health risk behaviors, including using cigarettes, marijuana, alcohol, stimulants, early sexual activity, depression and suicidal ideation and physical fights. In fact, there is law enforcement data showing that juvenile crime peaks in these unsupervised after school hours. Um, and there's still more abundant evidence shows that when schools do move their bell times later, more students actually do get more sleep. And they show fewer signs of depression, they use stimulants and illegal substances less, um, the rates of truancy and tardiness drop, the graduation weight rates rise, the grades and test scores rise, the car crash rates fall. So, when, and more so, this is even a, a health equity issue um, because when school starts later, children of lower socioeconomic status benefit disproportionately. So um, these outcomes benefit the entire community. And in fact, just basing their calculations on the higher graduation rates and the lower car crash rates, the Rand Corporation projected that starting middle and high schools no earlier than 8.30 a.m., could boost the US economy by at least $8.6 billion after just two years. Within that short time frame, any costs of change far outweighed by the benefits. And, and, and these gains would rise to $140 billion for the nation after 15 years, which is about 9.3 billion annually on average. So what is, why is this such a fight? It seems so obvious there's scientific consensus. The, the evidence is incredibly strong that we should not be starting schools as early in the morning as unfortunately most US middle and high schools do um, and have for 30 or 40 years. Well, the reason, the problem is that there's a lack of awareness about adolescent sleep needs. There's a general fear of change and really the problem is that we are treating what is a public health problem like a negotiable school budget item. And that lets adult convenience triumph over the well-being and health of children far too often. This is where we think as an organization that specific actions and policies at the federal level could be invaluable. Um, and, in, and specifically the three items that we are particularly interested in seeing some policies on right now are more efforts to collect and report disaggregable data about school hours and first bus pickup times, because we think this would raise awareness in state and local communities. It would also alert local decision makers to disparate health and learning outcomes in disadvantaged children who disproportionately, as I mentioned, cannot compensate for their very early school hours. So that's number one. We'd like to see the more data collected and it has to be disaggregable, which right now we know a little bit about what's happening, but we really can't break it down by district. Um, we also need parameters for safe, healthy, equitable school hours to help school districts ensure safe, healthy, productive, equitable, and evidence-based hours um, so that basically the ability to get healthy sleep doesn't vary by zip code. We were behind the legislation in California, which you may know about, that basic, that will kick in by the end of next year that is going to prohibit high schools from starting classes before 8.30 a.m. and middle schools before 8 a.m. We need more parameters and guidelines even at the federal level about what reasonable start times are. This would make it a lot easier for local districts to make these decisions. And finally, we need more public health policies, and I know we're all in agreement on this, to raise public consciousness about the role of sleep and school hours in student health, safety, learning, and equity. So we're talking about agency-sponsored workshops, congressional briefings, position statements, print and electronic materials, and of course, including healthy school hours as a best practice. Essentially, by... Um, helping to create a culture of sleep health, these efforts would simultaneously help build the political will that will allow school communities to set healthy, sleep-friendly hours. Um, that's what it amounts to, and I appreciate your attention, especially at this late time. I look forward to working with many of you to turn these ideas into action. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tara. I think, you know, when we talk about screening for sleep disorders, uh, always, it's an interesting issue to think about when we have a sleep deprived culture, especially in schools by, by creation, you know, um, so how do you even separate sleep de 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 deprived kids from sleep disordered 
students. So um, such important work. <laughs> um, and certainly not uh, last, but certainly not least, we have Wake Up Narcolepsy. Uh, I believe we have two board members, Anne and Tammy here. Um, I don't know which one of you are going first, but excited to hear you um, present on behalf of Wake Up Narcolepsy. Hi, Julie and Hi. everyone. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate being here. Um, I'm Tammy Smith, and I'm joined by Anne Samarowick Rama, um, and we're both board members of Wake Up Narcolepsy, as you said. Um, it's really our pleasure to be part of the Sleep Advocacy Forum, sorry, um, and this community dedicated to helping people with narcolepsy and also all sleep disorders. Um, I became involved with Wake Up Narcolepsy several years after my daughter was diagnosed with narcolepsy one, uh, type one, uh, when she was 21. At the time, I knew really nothing about narcolepsy. And as I went along, I didn't know anyone who had even had it or was a parent of a child with narcolepsy. Um, so I was very, very lucky to connect with Monica Gao, one of the founders. Um, and that kind of started my journey with uh, working on the board of Wicked Narcolepsy. Um, we are a not-for-profit organization and we're focused on promoting awareness, education, and providing uh, funding for research for improved treatments and a cure. Two of our original founders, Monica and David Gao, have grown Wake Up Narcolepsy to where it is today. Wake Up Narcolepsy has given over $940,000 to researchers to date since its inception in 2008. Uh, at this point, we hope to achieve their, their overall, our overall goal of a million dollars, a million dollars raised uh, to give to researchers uh, by the end of this year. Uh, so we're very, very excited about that milestone. Uh, with the help of our donor and medical communities, along with the pharmaceutical companies, we provide many supportive resources to people with narcolepsy and their families. We have weekly support groups, we have uh, in-person education days and now webinars. We also have Narcolepsy 360 podcasts and Camp for Kids. Uh, we reach out to all people of all ages um, and life phases and backgrounds. Uh, when we do have our events, our speakers include doctors, researchers, and people with narcolepsy. They cover topics such as diagnosis and treatment, new medications, psychosocial aspects, and personal experiences of living with narcolepsy. We also do have ongoing sleep awareness campaigns. Um, now I'm going to hand it off to Anne. Thank you, Tammy, um, and thank you, Julie, for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here. We appreciate your hard work in putting this forum together. Um, as, I, as I said, I'm Anne Samara Vikrama, and I have been with uh, Wake Up Narcolepsy for about five years. Uh, my son was diagnosed when he was 11, and he's now 23 and uh, he's attending college. Um, I will talk a little bit about the common con concerns that are important and I have, have discussed often at our education days, podcasts, webinars, and support groups. Then I will wrap up with uh, Wake Up Narcolepsy's funding of research to find better treatments. Um, during these last years, all our programs went online and we were able to reach a wider audience. We found that a lot of the discussions centered around finding the right treatment and the best mix of medication to cope with the symptoms of narcolepsy, type one, type two, and IH, um, idiopathic hypersomnia. It is amazing to see how many people have in common in terms of discussing their delays in um, diagnosis as well as the mis misdiagnosis. We hear about the challenges of coping with more than one disorder, as well as the frustration of dealing with insurance de uh, denials. Many caregivers of children with narcolepsy and IH struggle with giving medication to kids that are usually meant and tested only for adults. Um, for example, if you have narcolepsy, ADD, anxiety, it is complicated and, and overwhelming. Um, these concerns are discussed weekly at our various support groups with shared empathy and support and understanding. Um, I want to give a shout out to uh, Matt Horsnell who is here and has been uh, so involved in our support group, so thank you. Um, going forward, um, 
uh, wake up narcolepsy promotes awareness and education, as Tammy said. Um, we are, we think it's so important and critical for this community. We urge anyone with narcolepsy and IH to increase their understanding by taking advantage of the many resources provided by Wake Up Narcolepsy. We are passionate about this cause and we are dedicated um, to this community. Our main fundraising events include the participation in the Boston Marathon that is sponsored by John Hancock, and as, as well as the Seattle Giving Campaign and the End of the Year Campaign. We just wrapped up the uh, Boston Marathon, which was delayed, uh, and we raised uh, over $53,000 for research. Uh, we like to thank those runners who ran for us. Um, these funds are then granted to researchers to do all their studies and, and in different areas. We find that these researchers um, lead to significant publications in many journals, and it also helps them to secure more federal funding. So we are excited to reach our $1 million raised in funds for, for research, and we couldn't have done it without all the support from all the community here. So we look forward to many more years of, of helping this community. And uh, please uh, look us up on wakeupnarcolepsy.org. And thank you again, Julie, for all your work. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, Tammy. Um, it, you know, <laughs> so much great work. Thank you, Matt. Hey, thank you, Bridget. Lots of people here in the community um, that are, you know, benefit so much from all of your work and, um, and love the commitment to research and, and what that has led to in publications and I'm sure in um, and more grants uh, for those researchers on a federal level. So um, that private investment is really, really important. Um, so thank you for leading that effort.